Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in today's presentation we're going to be continuing with Paleozoic Earth history. So in this presentation we're going to be focusing on the late Paleozoic, so that's the Devonian, the Carboniferous and the Permian. Okay, let's get going. So what's happening during the late Paleozoic? Well in the early Paleozoic uh, it was a relatively peaceful time when it comes to the geology of North America. By the late Paleozoic things are getting a lot more exciting. So late Paleozoic sediments reflect continued fluctuations in sea level, so we're going to see these marine transgressions and regressions. We're going to see some variation in climate as well, because Laurentia is going to start moving away from the equator, just a little bit, not too far, but that's going to begin to allow us to see new types of sedimentary rock making an appearance. We're also going to see uh, some major continental collisions and the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. So, okay, so what's going on in Devonian? Well, during the Silurian, the north portion of the Iapetus Ocean closed up um, but as Baltica collided with Laurentia, and that, produced the, and that produces the Caledonian orogeny. So the Caledonian orogeny and the Caledonian highlands are mostly located in what is now modern-day uh, northeastern Canada and Scandinavia in Europe. So during the Devonian, uh, the southern Iapetus Ocean continued to close. So the Iapetus Ocean didn't just close up as one large event. It actually started by, with the closure of the Iapetus in the north, and that closure then continued in a southerly direction. So think of it like a zipper closing up. Okay, It starts at the top, and then as you, it closes up as you head southwards over time. So this closure of the Iapetus Ocean is obviously going to lead to strong compressional forces. It's also going to lead to shear forces, so we're going to see a mixture of both convergent plate tectonics and transform plate tectonics taking place. So it gets a little bit complicated. So the, these tectonic processes are going to cause a substantial thrusting and folding. It's going to lead to the formation of very large strike slip faults. And all this is going to be located along Laurentia's uh, south and east coasts, or what's now the modern day eastern coast. So we also have the collision of southern Baltica plus Avalonia uh, with Laurentia, and that's going to lead to the formation of the Acadian orogeny. We're also going to see a few volcanic islands colliding along with what is now the modern day east coast of Laurentia as well. And we're actually going to see a, uh, an island arc colliding along the west coast. So other Devonian tectonic events include the, uh, the Cordillera, so west coast, antler orogeny. Uh, we also have the Inuitian orogeny, which is sometimes referred to as the Ellesmere orogeny, occurring along the north coast. So as you can see, as we moved into the late Paleozoic, things are beginning to change a little bit. The east coast, what is now the modern day east coast, should I say, of North America is becoming quite tectonically active. We have some tectonic activity occurring along the west coast and the north coast as well. So the Inuitian orogeny was probably the result of a collision with a microcontinent, so similar to Avalonia, but a different microcontinent. Although the, the Inuitian orogeny could possibly have been caused by Siberia coming close to the northern margin of Laurentia. So when you have two large pieces of crust moving towards each other, it can actually cause quite substantial deformation of both pieces, even if the pieces of continental crust never actually hit each other. So there is the possibility the Inuit and Orogeny could be caused by uh, the continent of Siberia coming close to what is now the modern day uh, northern coast of North America. However, uh, that's uncertain. It was probably produced by a microcontinent hitting the modern day north coast of North America. So erosion of the Caledonian and Taconic Highlands produced massive quantities of sediment, and these went to form what are referred to as red beds. So these are essentially iron stained sandstones. So sandstones of a deep red color. So these are referred to as the old red sandstones of Europe and the Catskill Delta in North America. So for the majority of the Devonian, the climate was stable. It was pretty hot and dry, hence the desert sediments. 
However, towards the end, global temperatures decreased and we begin to see glaciers forming on Gondwana and also along the eastern coasts of what is now, well, the east coast of modern day North America, what would have been the southern coast of Laurasia. So that's because that area is semi mountainous, obviously, going to start forming alpine glaciers in the elevated terrain. So here's our situation by the early Devonian. So we have Laurentia here and we have Baltica and Avalonia over here. So you can see the collision between Baltica and Laurentia, sorry, Laurentia has gone and produced this line of mountains here. So these are the Caledonian mountains, and you can see they're going to primarily affect, you know, the east coast of Greenland. They're actually going to affect some of the more northerly islands of Canada, and they're going to affect what is now modern day Scandinavia over here. So you can just see there's the east coast of Scandinavia. So that's approximately where Norway would be. So we also have Avalonia down here. That's obviously going to interact with what is now modern day eastern Canada. And down here we have what's left of the Taconic Highlands, which obviously formed in the early Paleozoic. Now, both of these areas of high ground are obviously going to be eroded away, and that's going to lead, lead to the formation of substantial quantities of clastic sediment. And we also know that the climate during this period is going to be quite hot and dry. So uh, both Laurentia and Baltica are going to be covered by... Um, arid or semi-arid environment so we're going to get lots and lots of desert deposits and so we've got, what we're going to see is we're going to see the formation of large quantities of sandstones associated with the erosion of these high areas of high ground and we're going to see them in Europe where they are referred to as the old red sandstone and in modern day North America where they're referred to as the Catskill Delta. So by the Middle Devonian, we still have what's left of the Caledonian Highlands here. I should point out, by the way, here we have the Inuitian orogeny taking place right there. And you can see the resulting Inuitian Highlands there. Now over here, we have the Acadian Highlands. Okay, so they are forming by the Middle Devonian and they are quite complicated. They're probably formed by a mixture of island arcs hitting the modern day East Coast of North America, but there's also a strike slip component. So there's actually a trans, a very large transform fault that's running down the modern day East Coast. And this will actually take some of the uh, crust of Avalonia and it starts to push it down along the East Coast. And that also helps to add to the deformation. It makes for a very, very complex uh, situation. Now I should point out some of you might have spotted there's actually a landmass that's steadily creeping in in the bottom right of the image. So this is Gondwana. And eventually, obviously, when Gondwana hits Laurasia, we form the supercontinent of Pangaea. So you can see as we as we've been progressing through the Devonian, we obviously have a marine transgression taking place. So by the late Devonian, most of the United States is underwater. Quite a large amount of Canada is also underwater as well. Obviously, the Acadian Highlands are going to be above sea level. And so that's the general situation for the Devonian. So if we look at this rather simplified diagram from the textbook, we can see that by the, uh, by the Devonian, we have Laurasia. So we have Baltica over here, Laurentia here. So this would, would have been the location of the Taconic Highlands here. These are going to be the Caledonian Mountains here. Now the, uh, the Acadian Highlands are produced as island arcs start to hit onto the side of uh, Laurasia as Gondwana starts to move northwards. At the same time, we also have a major strike slip fault, which takes piece of, pieces of Avalonian continental crust from here and starts pushing them down along the coastline as well. That's also going to add to the, uh, the deformation. On the west coast, or what is now the modern day west coast, should I say, we have an island arc hitting, and that's going to produce the Antler Highlands here. And of course, we have the Inuitian orogeny, which we were just discussing up here. So over here we have Siberia and Kazakhstania. They're moving off approximately. They're moving approximately northwest to the northwest of Laurasia. And then down here to the south of Laurasia we have Gondwana, the supercontinent consisting of South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica. And so Gondwana started over here on the opposite side of the globe. It's been moving steadily over the South Pole. 
and it's going to continue that movement it's going to keep moving northwards and eventually it's going to run straight into Laurasia and so this body of water here is going to be steadily lost as the seafloor gets subducted away and that's obviously going to eventually lead to a collision so what's happening in the Carboniferous? So by the Carboniferous, Gondwana is obviously continuing to move over the South Pole and it's heading straight for Laurasia. So there's going to be a big crash. So during this time period, we're also going to see uh, the advance and retreat of uh, glaciers. And this is going to affect global sea level. So during the Carboniferous, we're going to see sea levels rising and falling. So the sea levels will rise as glaciers melt and fall as glaciers form. So remember, as a glacier forms, it locks up water in the form of ice. And that water can therefore not return to the ocean basin. So as Gondwana continued to move northwards, it will begin its collision with Laurasia in the early Carboniferous. So that's when we see the first indicators of Gondwana and Laurasia starting to affect each other. The collision will eventually lead to the formation of the supercontinent of Pangaea. So during this time period, we have Gondwana will actually rotate clockwise a little bit. And this actually leads to a collision which progressed in a northeast southwest direction. So if we just come back over here, what's going to happen is now remember, this is Baltica. So this is modern day Europe and this is North America. The initial collision itself is going to start here in the northeast where we have modern day Europe. And that's going to form the uh, Hessinian orogeny. So it's going to form the Hessinian mountains right here. We're then going to have the collision of Gondwana with the, what is now the modern day east coast of the United States. That's going to obviously lead to the Appalachians. And we're also going to have a set of smaller collisions over here in what is now the modern day Gulf Coast area. And that's going to lead to the formation of a set of mountains called the Achetan Mountains. So we can see that thrust faulting during the final phases of this collision between uh, Laurasia and Gondwana form the Achetan Mountains of Oklahoma and Arkansas in the late Carboniferous to early Permian. So we know that the collision is still ongoing into the Permian. OK, so the collision starts in the early Carboniferous, but it's not a fast event. This is remember, this is a big collision. It takes a long time to happen, but it also takes a long time to stop. And so the collision might start in the early Carboniferous, but it's still going by the early Permian. So by the early Carboniferous, what's going on? OK, so by this point, you can see we have Gondwana and obviously it's affected what is now you know, modern day Europe. So here's continental Europe here. You can see we have a line of mountains there. That, those are the Hessinian mountains. That's the Hessinian orogeny. Here we have the collision itself between what is now the modern day east coast, but obviously it would have been the south coast of Laurasia at the time. OK, so remember, north is going to be up here and that's going to give us the Appalachians. And then we have a number of collisions which happen down here in what is now the modern day Gulf Coast area it would have been the west coast of Laurasia at the time. And that leads to the formation of the Achetan orogeny, so the Achetan mobile belt. Over here on what is now the modern day west coast, which would have been the north coast of Laurasia, we have the collision of a island arc terrain onto the west coast, modern day west coast, should I say, and that's going to lead to the antler orogeny. Now, by the late Carboniferous, the antler orogeny stopped. We can see that Gondwana and Laurasia have both locked into each other, so essentially deformation has you know, slowed down, near, nearly stopped. But you can see we have this continuous chain of mountains. So we have the Hassinian Mountains grading into the Appalachian Mountains, grading into the Achetan Mountains. So think of it a bit like the uh, the Alps as they grade into the, uh, the Zagros Mountains of Iran and the Zagros Mountains grade into the Himalayan Mountains. So it's a, it's a very similar type of situation. Now, what we see in the uh, Carboniferous is we see a time during which we have very variable sea levels. And so that means we have lots of marine transgressions and regressions taking place during this time period. And that means there are large coastal areas that get inundated by shallow seas for short periods of time. And so this means the coastlines of some parts of Laurentia and Baltica become quite swampy. And so these are the perfect conditions for the formation of large amounts of coal. And so during the Carboniferous, 
Pennsylvania in particular, we get the formation of very, very large coal swamps associated with these marine, little marine transgressions and regressions that are taking place as we have glacial advances and retreats. So elsewhere during the Carboniferous, we get Kazakhstania colliding with Siberia. And the resulting landmass will begin to move towards Laurasia's eastern margin. So it's going to start moving towards Baltica. And this is going to lead to the growth of the Uralian Mobar Belt and the formation of the Ural Mountains. So during this period, we get these large coal deposits, which we were just discussing. And we tend to get the largest ones forming in North America, Western Europe and the Donitz Basin of Ukraine. So these basins would have been located in near equatorial conditions. So the environment would have been quite warm. We know this, you know, we know the climate must have been quite warm and quite stable because when we look at the fossilized trees, which we see as part of the coal deposits, we note that the trees do not have tree rings. So this is telling us that there's no periods where the trees are really, you know, suffering. So we know that tree rings are annual. And we know that the thickness of the tree, thing, tree ring essentially uh, represents how successful the tree has been. So if the tree has good conditions, it will produce a nice thick tree ring. If the tree is suffering quite, in quite a harsh set of conditions, the tree rings will often be quite narrow. However, what we see with these trees, is, which are part of the Carboniferous coal forming measures, uh, coal measures, uh, we see that they're pretty much tree ring free, which would suggest a nice stable climate. Now, we also know that coal swamps like to form in coastal areas. Those coastal areas tend to be near the equator. And we also know that the areas tend to be quite humid. So, you know, and quite swampy. So that gives us a good idea about where Laurentia, or should I say uh, Laurasia, was located during the Carboniferous. So we know we are somewhere near the equator during this period because that would encourage the formation of these very, very large coal swamps. So the, this is our basic situation. So we have the early Carboniferous up here in the top left and the late Carboniferous down here in the bottom right. So what's going on? Well, obviously we have Laurentia here. We have Baltica here, we have what's left of the Caledonian Highlands here, and here we have the Acadian Highlands, okay, which are in exactly the same location as the Taconic Highlands. Now, obviously, we have the collision between Gondwana and Laurasia. That's going to produce the Hercynian Mountains here in southern Europe. It's going to lead to the Appalachian Mountains here along the modern day east coast of North America. And collisions over here are going to give us the Achetan Mountains. At the same time, we have Kazakhstania is about to make contact with Siberia. And Gondwana is obviously continuing its movement over the South Pole. Please note the very large ice sheets there. Now, by the time we're in the late Carboniferous, Kazakhstania and Siberia have crashed into each other. And northern China is actually also about to hit Kazakhstania. So that's created a supercontinent here. And you'll notice that Siberia is just starting to interact with what is the east coast of Laurasia, which would now be essentially the modern day Ural Mountains. So this is the formation of the Urals taking place right here. We can see that Gondwana and Laurasia have made uh, full contact with each other. And this has produced a rather large mountain chain that starts with the Hacinian Mountains over here into the Appalachians and then finally over here into the Achetan Mountains. You'll also notice that we still have extensive glaciation because we have a nice big piece of continental crust situated directly over the South Pole. And as we've discussed, these glaciations are going to help to control global sea levels. When the glaciers grow and get bigger, they lock up water, global sea levels drop. When the glaciers melt, they put water back into the oceans, global sea levels will rise. So during the Permian, the formation of Pangaea was complete. So we have a supercontinent at this point. So the position of the western portions of Pangaea are very well constrained. However, some questions remain about the number or shapes of various terrains that, com that comprise the eastern half of Pangaea. So if we just go back to the previous slide, we have a very good idea about what's happening here. 
and that is because uh, in terms of geologic study a lot of geologic study has tended to focus on Europe North America and Russia those areas have been very very heavily studied and so this means we have a very good idea about what's happening in the area up here now the uh, terrains of what are now the modern day southern hemisphere continents aren't quite as well uh, studied and so we are a little bit less certain about what the coastline would have looked like along the eastern portion of Gondwana so we need to bear that in mind that's that's you know strictly a reflection of the fact that you know we have some very very large southern hemisphere continents they haven't been studied quite as uh, as well as the northern hemisphere continents given time we are going to improve our model even further so the supercontinent was surrounded by numerous subduction zones that resulted in a net northward movement okay so the supercontinent of Pangaea is going to continue to move northwards so it's a period of erosion for Laurasia so Laurasia is exposed so it's above sea level for large periods of time that's obviously going to lead to substantial amounts of erosion lots of clastic sediment being produced which is then transported by large rivers to the coast so here's our basic situation in the Permian. You'll notice, by the way, we have lots of brown colors because once again, just like the Devonian, the Permian was a relatively hot and dry period. So that's going to lead to, you know, lead to the formation of rocks like desert deposits and also uh, rocks like evaporites. You can see we have what's left of the Hacinian Mountains here, what's left of the Appalachians here, and what's left of the Achetan Mountains down here. And you'll notice as we go from the early Permian to the late Permian, they're just being eroded away. And by the late Permian, the Hacinian Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains and the Achetan Mountains are nearly completely gone. We can, however, begin to see here the early signs of the crust beginning to undergo extension. OK, so the crust along this interface here is beginning to be stretched. And so this is the start of the rift that's going to end up forming the Atlantic Ocean. During the late Permian, we also have an isolated body of water here. So think of it as approximately the same size as the Mediterranean Sea. And so this body of water gets isolated and it begins to evaporate away. And it produces an absolutely massive set of evaporite deposits, which are referred to as the Zechstein. And so these evaporites extend all the way from the east coast of the United Kingdom through northern Europe, so through Germany, Poland, and even all the way into western Russia. So Pangaea was surrounded by a single massive ocean called Panthalassa and this ocean circulated freely and now because the water can circulate freely it allows water from the equator to efficiently move into higher latitudes so it means that nice warm equatorial water can push towards the poles without being hindered. And so this means that global ocean temperatures were actually quite homogenized. It was quite a nice uniform situation. Now compare that to the modern situation where we have warm water around the equator. We then have a band of more temperate water and then we have a band of very cold water as we approach the poles. So obviously because we have these different uh, conditions in the modern environment, that's obviously going to lead to different life you know, evolving to suit each of those different environments. With regards to, uh, regard to life in the Permian, on the other hand, because we have this homogenization of the oceans, it means we do tend to see the same organisms occurring in a very wide range of locations because conditions were just so similar. So the formation of Pangaea and several mountain ranges had climatic consequences. So we see the core of Pangaea becomes arid to semi-arid, so it becomes desert to semi-desert. So the question is, is, well, why is that? Well, if we just go back, here we have, you know, what's left of our line of mountains, essentially Hacinian, Appalachian, Achetan, and they form a continuous barrier. You can see it there. And so they end up forming what's called a rain shadow. And so what we have is we have uh, uh, essentially water, uh, water bearing air. So rain bearing air is moving northwestwards and it hits the mountains. And so this, this air has to go over the top of the mountains if it wants to continue on its journey. 
However, as the air starts to rise over the high ground, the air temperature begins to decrease, and this encourages the dropping of moisture from the air in the form of rain or snow. And so as your air moves across your mountain chain, it loses water, so by the time the air makes it onto the other side of your mountain range, the air is actually quite dry. And so that means that the air in this area here is going to be quite dry. At the same time, because Pangaea is such a large continent, areas like this area here are a very, very long way from the coast. Typically, the closer you are to the coast, the wetter the environment becomes. Therefore, the further away from the coast you are, the drier the environment is. So Pangaea has this double whammy, essentially, of these very large mountain ranges that create numerous rain shadows, combined with the fact that Pangaea is so large means that the core of Pangaea begins to become very hot and very dry. So think of the situation we have in Central Asia. Okay, If you know anything about Central Asia, you'll know typically the climate in Central Asia tends to be a very, very arid climate. You know, mainly because the area is just so far away from any major source of water. So these arid conditions produce substantial red beds. So here are these red sandstones again, and evaporites in Northern Europe and North America in particular. Now, because we have this shift in global climate from a you know warmer, wetter climate in the Carboniferous to a much drier, hotter climate in the Permian, we see the coal fields begin to move. So if you remember, the coal fields of the Carboniferous were located in this approximate area here and in this area over here. What we're seeing, though, is these areas are now desert or semi-desert environments. So this means the coal fields have actually shifted northwards into these more temperate regions up here, where the conditions are still warm, but there's a little bit more uh, essentially humidity around, which, are be which is better for the formation of large coal swamps. So here's our general overview of what's going on in the Permian. So we can see here we have Pangaea consisting of Laurasia in the top and Gondwana in the bottom. You can see we have well, this landmass which consists of Siberia, Kazakhstania and northern China essentially is impacting along the, the coast of Baltica. That's giving us the Ural Mountains. And we can see that uh, South China is still operating uh, independently by itself in the middle of the Panthalescent Ocean over here. OK, you can see, by the way, we have this very, very large body of water right here. OK, but Panthalesa, if you'll notice, there's no hindrance in the path of water moving from the equator to higher latitudes. And this allows us to have a nice, steady circulation of water, cold water coming south to the equator, being warmed up and pushed back north. And so because of this, we get this lovely homogenized ocean. So we get a, a, you know, a nice environment in which life can flourish. OK, so this is probably a good place to stop. So uh, stop the video here, get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water and then come back once you've relaxed for a few minutes for part two.